Our first speaker is Irem Tumer. She is from the United Nations in New York. Uh, she is the Global Youth Focal Point at UN Population Fund, working mainly on adolescents and youth. So let's welcome Irem Tumer. Hi, I'm Irem, um, and I probably don't look like what you would expect with big words such as United Nations, Global Youth Focal Point. Um, but I happen to be that, uh, based in New York. Um, and I'm a 26-year-old woman from Turkey, having been in the UN for the last two years. I want to give you a taste of what you would find if you were to briefly stalk me on the internet. So let's do that. Um, so all this started when I started um, taking part in different youth organizations when I was in high school. Um, so I spent like nine to ten years in Model United Nations, European Youth Parliament, um, and then did a lot of projects on women's rights as well. I was a woman deliver young leader, um, which sort of gradually paved my way towards what I'm right now doing at the UN. Whilst I was doing all this, I was also studying law in Turkey, which is an undergraduate graduate degree over there. So I am a member of the Istanbul Bar, and before I started at the UN, I was actually a corporate lawyer working in construction law, um, which is not as inspiring as what I'm doing right now. Um, and then my life sort of changed when I was chosen for the Global Innovators Fellowship of UNFPA, um, and along with eight other inspiring young women, everywhere from Swaziland to Egypt to Palestine to Uganda, we were actually at the UN headquarters for a year, um, and this was actually one of the few programs in the UN system which gives developing country youth the um, possibility to become part of the UN network. And after that, um, I basically stayed on to take on the responsibilities of my supervisor. And right now, I basically coordinate the youth participation portfolio of UNFPA at the global level. Um, so that's me. Um, as a person, I like photos. I have an Instagram, you can take a look. I like traveling, I like reading, um, I like going out and friends and all that. So that's the non-UN face. Um, and today, I'm with you to talk about pressing global issues, no biggie, especially in 2017. Um, and I'll do my best to try and do that. Let's start with this. In a world full of so much like light and shadow and for some reason painful memories or experiences seem to stick with us or resonate with us a lot longer than positive ones sometimes I think the imagination protects us in the fact that it provides us with hope or possibilities or optimism or it's always a yes it's always a yes the imagination yes there's a way Yes, you can do this. I don't know how, but use your imagination. That's always the answer. The, 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 I think the imagination is a gift from the universe that gives you an, an aff affirming weapon of yes. All right, so how did we come from pressing global issues to imagination, which we associate maybe with our childhood or the big dreams that we had at the time? Um, so today I will try to introduce you the Sustainable Development Goals and the Global Agenda of the UN and also talk a little bit about what UNFPA is doing. Um, but even though these seem to be very technical and international and politics related topics, I would argue that they actually have a lot to do with imagination and dreams. I would even go further and argue that a lot of the things that we see today from companies to um, inspiring politicians to organizations are usually a result of our individual or collective imagination, whether it be Google's aim to have all the information of the world stored in their system, to Martin Luther King's dream, to the European Union's post-Second um, World War. Reality, it was actually a dream and a result of imagination in the first place that you know, resulted in all these things that we know today. And similarly, the UN um, was such a dream back in 1945. As Lord Halifax calls for a standing vote on the approval of the Charter of International Organizations, and the heads of the 50 United Nations delegations rise to be counted, the vote is unanimous. <laughs> As 
the session adjourns, delegates burst into applause. The charter of a new world is born. And this charter that was born it has this foreword that is usually quite an emblematic sentence. And it says, we, the peoples of the United Nations, determined all these things. And I tried to highlight to you some of the things because at the time, we can you know, argue a lot about whether UN was able to upkeep all these principles since 1945. But in the end, at a time when governments seem to talk a lot more about war and xenophobia and immigrants and walls and everything, I think it's good to remind ourselves that all, nearly all of the governments in this world at some point in time actually contracted to work towards justice, human rights, dignity, equality, freedom, security. So whether we like it or not, the UN Charter in itself is a very significant document in terms of reminding us of certain values that I think should be core to the existence of our future. And this was the thing that happened in 1945. But from 1945 to um, 2016, obviously a lot of things happened in the world which doesn't want to load right now. But what I want to say is, so 1945, United Nations starts. Then a lot of things happen, all these wars, other things. For a decade, we had the Millennium Development Goals. And then in 2016, the Sustainable Development Goals were adopted. Um, and if you just take it as Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations, I feel like it just comes across as a very technical, political thing. But what I'm trying to say is that these 17 goals that range from poverty to education to clean energy to innovation are actually a result of the collective imagination of the world um, to map out the future for ourselves. Um, and I won't get into what these goals are, but I just want to highlight a few reasons why I see global goals as an imagination activity. So firstly, global goals are in the end what 190 governments have agreed to in the world, which is a, the biggest pact that we have in terms of political will. But what's also important with the global agenda is that the people were also there. So unlike, unlike the Millennium Development Goals, which was just like a Kofi Annan vision of let's do this, let's do that, the global agenda was shaped after consultations with millions of young people, NGOs, private sector, etc. So there was a lot more in terms of being bottom to top, which I think is a great way for us to, you know, have an association with it. And secondly, it is a more, um, it connects the dots and it's a global and interconnected worldview. So it just sees the interconnectedness um, between everything from environment to health to, you know, sanitation to innovation. And lastly, for the first time ever, the Sustainable Development Goals really stress the importance of partnerships. So it really stresses that this is not a UN effect. This is something that must be done by the people, by academia, by private sector, all together. Um, which I guess is very important because all of you will have different paths one day. But the global goals are not something only for people who work at the UN like me, but a vision um, that will be implemented hopefully by every one of us. Um, so that is global goals in a nutshell. And then UNFPA, it is the United Nations Population Fund, which I know doesn't fit the abbreviation that you see here, but you know, such curious things happen at the UN. So what is our collective imagination as the UNFPA and what does my agency do? Let me tell you a little bit about that. So our imagination and our dream is delivering a world where every pregnancy is wanted, every childbirth is safe, and every young person's potential is fulfilled. I'm going to read the last part again because that's my favorite. Every young person's potential is fulfilled. Um, so how do we do that? We do that through very different things, ranging from combating harmful practices in developing countries to um, maternal health to demographic work to youth participation like I do. Uh, but I just wanted to cut together, like um, select a very small piece of what we do um, and relate it back to the global goals. So, this is from our um, State of the World Population Report 2016, which was about the 10-year-old girl. Um, so for UNFPA, the adolescent girl it really is very important. And we say that if you reach someone, especially a girl, who are a lot more impacted by injustices and a lot of other negative things, at the age of 10, then you might have um, outcomes that will change the society as well as the girl's lives. So here, we'll take a look at one girl 
and two possible paths um, in terms of what could happen to her. So let's meet Gayatri um, at 2016, and she's 10 years old. So the path one is the more positive one. And what happens is that um, Gayatri's parents get a conditional ca cash transfer, which means they will get some money if Gayatri keeps on going to school. So she basically stays in school at the age of 10 and 11. In path two, however, they say that if she goes to secondary school, the expenses will be a lot more. Um, and you know, what is the point anyway? She can just be married or help around the house. So basically she drops out of school at the age of 10 um, while her brothers continue to go to school. What happens at the age of 12 is that in the great scenario, Gayatri qualifies for scholarship and she goes to the local secondary school um, and she basically connects with her friends, um, has a social presence and has agency to um, have some you know, control over her life. Whereas in the other scenario, she leaves school after primary school and then they just wed her off um, to a 20 year old man um, when she's 15. Um, and the decision is based more on the fact that they're not asking for a dowry. Um, so it makes financial sense to go for this future husband. So Gayatri is married at the age of 15. Um, and in the first scenario, she completes secondary school and she starts work and she opens her first bank account and she starts saving some money. Whereas in the other one, um, she gives birth to her first child at the age of 16. Um, of course, her health is impacted by this because if you have a baby at such a young age, then you will probably have some maternal health complications. Um, and then after that, because of lack of access to family planning, she gives birth to her second child at 19. Um, and at 21, our Gayatri, the positive scenario Gayatri, just starts, um, she gets married, but she already has an education, so she knows about family planning and has access to contraception which means that she will only have her first child when she's 23 and it is her decision to do so. Whereas the other Gayatri um, sometimes works as an unskilled laborer just to help with the household budget and she gives um, birth to her third child at 23 and she wants to discuss birth control options but her in-laws think that it's unacceptable to you know, try and stop that. Um, so by the age of 25 in 2030, um, Gayatri is an educated woman who is working with one child who she hopes to stay, um, keep in school. Um, and the other Gayatri is the mother of three children and she is on low resources. Um, and she hopes that her daughter will be able to go to school, but because of her limited income, she will not be able to guarantee that that's the case. What I'm trying to show here is that as UNFPA, we do a lot of programming around this from child marriage programs to empowerment programs to maternal health programs to family planning programs. So that's as an agency, we can make sure that a lot of girls like Gayatri have path one instead of path two in their lives. Um, but of course we see that this is not too far away from global goals. So this girl's story is actually a, a you know, reflection of the global goals. The, the obvious ones that I could point to would be like goal one, no poverty, good health and well-being for her, quality education and gender equality. But if you look at the entire um, global goals, you could see that from the house that she lives in, goal nine infrastructure, to how much she has decision-making power in policy making, which would be you know, the 16 institutions, actually all of these do correspond to every single individual's lives. Um, so they can really be applied from the individual level to the society level to the international level. Um, and basically what I'm trying to say in terms of global goals is that there is a lot of youth around the world who are doing great stuff and they do link it to global goals. I think that this is just one of the alternatives of how the world could be like in the future. So for every one of us here, we'll definitely have a different dream and a different result of imagination in terms of what is closer to our heart or what we want to see in the future. Um, so I believe that global goals are um, big enough and encompassing enough for all of us to forge a personal connection with them. 
some of us may be more interested in the technology front, whereas some others might be more passionate about, you know, violence against women, whereas I'm passionate about participation and how to get young people's voice heard. But what is important is to see, you know, what part fits your vision for the future and what parts is closer to your heart and your dreams. Um, so that is the first part. And then the second part, of course, is how do we make that dream that we have individually or collectively the reality that we have for the future? Um, and I know that especially in this political climate, it sometimes looks daunting to you know, try and tackle all the things that are happening in the world. But I know that these two days will be an inspiring start for you to meet some people who are already trying to make this a reality. And by tomorrow, you will be having your own ideas and solutions in terms of how we can make that dream come true and how we can turn our imagination into our reality. Um, I think that there are 101 ways in which you can do that. Some of you might end up being having your career in the development sector or the public sector like I did. But I think what's important is, is to keep this imagination and keep these values with you even if you're in corporate, even if you're a CEO, if you're a teacher, you know, no matter where you're at, there will be some part of your life in which you can incorporate these values and work towards social change. And I really hope that these two days will be uh, a good starting point and a good source of inspiration for you to do that. Um, because I do believe that if we are to succeed in anything and if we are to succeed in living in a world that is up to our standards, then we first should be able to imagine it. Um, so don't forget that that's per perhaps something to hold on to. Um, and I'll be around for the next two days. Come and talk to me and ask any of the questions that you might have. And I'm very, very excited and thankful to be here and meet all of you. Thank you.